you know, first of all, for those of you who don't know me, I think I know most of you on the call. Um, I'm Todd Albert. I'm the founder and lead instructor here at Boca Code. Um, also want to, you know, acknowledge that we're very proud members of Palm Beach Tech and Palm Beach Tech community. Um, if you don't know about Palm Beach Tech, please check it out, palmbeachtech.com. Join the Slack. It's really awesome. Great community. You might find some of the people on this in this call in that, especially in the developers channel. You can also go to bocacode.com, join our Slack community if you're not a member there as well. Um, so let, tonight I want to talk about deploying. Um, you know, most of us on this call are developers and we know how to build some amazing applications and websites and all kinds of things. And then, and then how do you deploy it in a professional way, right? And I'm, I'm going to tell a couple of stories tonight as well as, as, well as go through this. Um, but, but I want to start with this cartoon here, which is, you know, the first frame is he or she, whatever, saying, can you pass the salt? And then they're sitting there waiting. I said, and then the <laughs> other person responds, I know I'm developing a system to pass arbitrary condiments. It's been 20 minutes. It'll save time in the long run. Right. So I think <laughs> as developers, we're very familiar with this idea that, you know, sometimes you just want to get something done quickly and it's not practical to build out a system for it. And other times you really are like, well, I'm going to be doing this all the time. I should really build out a system for it. Um, but I, I just want to caution against this idea of, of over engineering. And we'll talk more about that. And um, as I get into a couple of the stories, but the, the first I want to, I want to take you guys back. Um, some of us on this call will, will remember the old days um, fondly or not so fondly. And some of you are, you know, too young to, to really remember these days, but I think it's good to start here that in the, you know, in the, in the quote unquote old days, and you know, this is as recently as eight, 10 years ago, when you wanted to deploy an application, like a web application, first thing you would do is provision a server. And you could either use a shared server, which would be like a virtual machine or an actual dedicated server, which was like a chunk of metal, whether this was in your closet or it was in the proverbial cloud. But, you know, Damien will tell you there is no cloud. It's just other people's computers. Um, <laughs> true, right? Um, Oh, <laughs> Angel, I wasn't even thinking of the salt for like a password security reference. That's clever. Um, so, you know, usually you would rent server space somewhere, again, whether it's shared, which was very inexpensive or dedicated, which could be very expensive, but you would provision a server. Sometimes then you would have to install an operating system on that server. Oftentimes, you know, whether it's Linux or Windows, Maybe that came pre-installed, but then you'd have to install your database software, whether it was you were using MySQL or Postgres or SQL Server. Then you install the server software, the web server software, like Apache or, or IIS. Then you have to install your web software, like you have to have the right version of PHP or ASP or .NET or whatever you're using. And then you set up your hosts and you have to handle the routing and your HD access file or however you know, depending on the server setup. So it was a lot of work to get this server set up before you could even show a page, right? And that's how things were for, for quite some time. Um, and then, you know, aside from that, you constantly would have security updates, upgrades to software, security um, issues, right? People would attack your server all the time and you had to put, um, you know, security measures in place to handle that. So this was, you know, this was a lot of work. You, you were constantly working to keep your server, keep your server up and secure and running. And, um, you know, back around this time, one of the big projects I worked on was called Mad Valorum. It actually doesn't exist anymore. They just, they just deprecated it. But I took on this project when it was, they had 12 developers working on it. It was a mess of code. Uh, it didn't look like this. Um, this is what it looked like a few years ago. And um, they were running it on a, a on what's called an on-metal server. So in other words, they had their own server provisioned. It was a Windows-based server. It was running SQL. And it was costing the company about $3,000 a month in, in server costs. So I came in and I said, you know what? If we move to a LAMP server, 
you know, which is Linux, Apache, MySQL, PHP. I could rewrote, rewrite the whole code because their code was garbage. It needed to be rewritten. Like, let me rewrite it in this open source software and we can provision a much less expensive server and it'll be much faster. And basically the only reason that their site was quick in any way, shape or form was because they had it on this massive, massive server with lots of RAM and fast disk and, and uh, you know, lots of CPU cores, et cetera. So they had it like really over provisioned even though their code was a mess. So I wrote very efficient code, which would run on a much smaller server. Um, but it was still, it was a lot of work. I was, I ended up being solo. They fired 12 developers had just me. I was doing DevOps. I was doing front end. I was doing back end. I was doing DBA. I was doing most of the design work. I was doing some of the marketing. It was ridiculous. Um, but it was a really cool project and they ended up giving me a, a large chunk of the company at the time to, uh, you know, so that was great. Um, and that was how things were done then. And then, you know, they started letting you provision servers with the software pre-installed and they slowly started making things even easier. And, you know, you can see that, you know, now there's, there's much easier ways, which we'll talk about. Um, but before we get into the ways of doing it is what is it? What are we, what are our goals here? What does it mean to deploy a site like a professional? So the key things that you want your, you know, you want your application to be scalable. And some of you might say, well, like that app that, that I worked on before Mad Valorum, it was originally, it was only intended for like four people to be able to use it. It wasn't intended to be the Zillow-esque app that it eventually became, but initially it was not meant to be quote unquote scalable and, and Number one is things change, right? So if you build it to not be scalable and then suddenly you pivot and now you want it to be scalable, you might have to change your infrastructure, which is not ideal. But also scalability can go both ways. You can scale it up. You can also scale it down or scale it in. So imagine if instead of paying $3,000 a month for his server, if he only paid for the traffic that he was using, right? So that when no one was using the site, his bill went down close to zero, and then it would scale up as more people use the site. So it used to be back in those days when we would build, when we would provision a server, we would tell our client like, oh yeah, well this is, this can handle up to 5,000 concurrent users. Once we get over that, we need a bigger server. And so you would have your site ready for 5,000 people at a time when there was only one or two on it at a time. So, so imagine if you can scale elastically where it can scale up and down instantly as needed and you're only paying for what you're using. That's the idea of scalability. That's the ultimate goal of scalability. Availability, we'll get into a little bit more in a minute, but basically it means that your site is, is readily available, quickly available for anyone, anywhere. Okay, and we'll, we'll talk a little bit about that in a moment. It also should be like quick and easy to deploy, you know, to roll out new code to, to roll back to old code if you, if you need to. Um, and then also it should keep your, your secrets secure and your network secure. So your secrets, if you don't, if you if you're not used to that that terminology in web speak, things like your API keys, your private keys, your you know, passwords, connection to your database, things like that, those things you want to remain secret. You don't want those to get out. Um, and then as a bonus, you know, maybe if you have different environments, so you can roll out to staging or to a development environment, then to staging, then to production, that type of thing. That would, you know, that's that's a bonus, right? So let's start, let's go through that list quickly and talk first about scalability. Um, you know, back when we would provision a server, the only option was to scale up. If, you know, if you, you, you provision a server that was this size and then you started to get more traffic or started to grow, you would have to get a larger server, transfer everything over and then shut down the old server while you were 
dealing with you know traffic and a lot of times there would be downtime in this and now the now we've moved to a system where instead of scaling up to a larger server we scale out so we keep these small but we go to many right have many and that way we can easily you know instead of having to like go to a bigger server copy the files over shut down the old you know put the traffic to the new server shut down the old server by how you can just scale up and have lots of duplicates of your server and then split the traffic between them. And then as traffic dies down, you can start shutting some of them down. So you can easily spin them up and shut them down. And that's a that's a much better way of scaling. And a lot of this stuff you probably are like, as I go through some of this, you're like, whoa, these are crazy concepts, but how the hell do I do this? We'll get there, right? I'm just trying to give the concepts so then when I give you the, the, the recipe, you understand, right? You wanna know what, what bitter and sweet and salty is before I tell you how to make this perfect recipe, right? Um, so scale, so how do you scale out? Well, one common, the common way that we do this now is by putting our applications into little containers. And one of the most common ways this is done nowadays is through a system called Docker. And basically what Docker does is it allows you to, to, to create a generic container. So the old way, as you see here on the right, was you'd have your, your server and then your server would have like VM virtual machine, um, virtual machine manager. And then you would spin up these little virtual machines on it. But those virtual machines would have to have their own operating system which used resources. So you had the operating system of the, the server, and then you would have the operating system of each of each virtual machine plus the virtual machine machine manager, which can be um, you know take a lot of resources. So the new way to do this is to containerize those those applications. And essentially, the way that the way that Docker works. Um, so, um, sorry, I'm just I'm just going to pause because I see there's some questions in the uh, in the chat. Yes, Liza, I'm recording this, so I will post this on YouTube in the next day or two, and you'll be able to get to it from BocaCode.com. Um, in past workshops, the current workshops become past workshops with links, so you'll be able to see that. Angel, yeah, Netflix uses um, Netflix definitely uses this. I don't know if they built Docker, I forget who actually created Docker. Um, but Netflix actually uses Docker with Kubernetes with Spinnaker on top of it. And, and I'll kind of get to some of that, but but you know, like what Kubernetes is and how it manages all of that. Um, but but yeah, it's um, you can really get more and more complex. And if you need high availability like Netflix, you need to, you know, you you need to build out some of this this infrastructure, but I'm going to show you a way to do this on the, you know, kind of cheaper, faster, easier. Um, but I want to give you these concepts first. So, so Docker, what the way that Docker works is Docker, it, there's lots of different Docker images that are available, which contain the basic software that you need, right? So let's say like if you're building a node application, you can get a Docker image that has node and it has express or whatever else you need in a in a small container and then what you do is you you can use docker to to bring that container onto your computer to copy your files for your application into it to then npm install or whatever you need to do to install the dependencies build your application with those dependencies and launch it inside that container and what's great is you can do that on your machine and test it and run it. And then you can do that same thing on your server using that same Docker image, using the same files and running the same commands and you should get the same results. And so this is a way where you can just, you know, you can have a small Docker image, your small files, pull in the, the, the libraries that are needed, build and run right there and, um, and have a lot of these these Docker containers can run on a single machine because they don't have to have the overhead of the operating system in them. So this is, you know, I don't want to give a whole talk on Docker, but this is essentially 
how you scale out, you can have these little containers that you can spin up anywhere. How do you manage that? To the, the most common way is, and preferred way, is a system that Google built, which is called Kubernetes. And Kubernetes is, is really for managing um, containers like Docker. It doesn't have to be, um, it doesn't have to be uh, Docker. And Dennis put in the chat that Solomon Hikes built and found Docker. I didn't think it was built by Netflix, but thank you for that, Dennis. <clears throat> so Kubernetes does things like it manages load balancing, meaning if you have your app is running on a, on, you know, here, 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 and here, it, it will send traffic evenly, roughly evenly to each one. So if you're getting a lot of traffic to one instance of your app, it'll start sending more to the others. So that's called load balancing. Um, it will also orchestrate storage. So if all of your if all of your little Docker containers need to connect to a certain storage or or have their own storage, it can orchestrate that. It can help with rollouts and rollbacks. Um, it does something called bin packing, which is like you can so instead of having one server set up, you can have servers set up all over the country called clusters or nodes, and Kubernetes will spin up additional um, what they call pods, which are like these, you know, the containers in these different nodes or clusters as they're needed, and it will fit them where they, you know, where they, where they fit best. So that's called bin packing. Um, and uh, it's also it's self healing. So let's say, you know, you say, you know, depending on, on the, the structure of your app, let's say you're like, I need a minimum of three three copies of my API to be running at all time and two copies of my website to be running at all time. If one of the containers running your API, let's say it crashes and that, that Docker container crashes, Kubernetes will spin up, will spin up another one, right? And so it manages all of that. With, it's called self-healing. It's like watching and saying, hmm, that one crashed. Let's spin up another one over here. And, and so it constantly makes sure that there's enough and as traffic comes, as traffic increases, it will spin up more. And as traffic decreases, it will bring it back down to your minimum, your minimum number. And um, yeah, Angel asked if you can like theoretically, you can use this for like running AI test cases and learning. Absolutely. Um, so, and it also does it also does secret management behind the scenes. So Kubernetes can manage secrets and deploy them along with these little pods really cool stuff. Um, Kubernetes is incredibly powerful. And just to give you a sense of how complex it is, there is one person in the state of Florida that is certified to teach Kubernetes. So some of you probably know him, Angel Ramirez, he works at Quemby. It is, oh my. yeah, that's, that's how complex this is. And um, you know, I want to talk about that when we get into some of these enterprise level, um, you know, solutions here is like, you know, right now, AWS um, re, re, what is it called? Reinvent? AWS, which one? Oh, the, the one that runs the Docker? The ones that, what the, the event that's going on right now. Oh, re, uh, yes, reinvent. Yes. Reinvent, right? So AWS reinvent is going on right now where, you know, it's this huge conference where you can go and learn and, you know, learn about all the different things with AWS. And, you know, they have these huge conference. It's a, it's a huge moneymaker, AWS for Amazon. Um, and, and, and it's very complicated. These things, you know, like doing things like load balancing, right? I, when I first took over um, the My Photo project uh, a few years ago, the senior developer handed it over to me and he's like, Everything's all set up in AWS. When you're ready to go live, you just have to merge into merge into into the master, and it will deploy. It's all set up. He had containers set up. He had servers set up in multiple regions. He had load balancing set up to point to the different ones. He had things set up to point the domains to the load balancers. He had all these pieces, but they actually weren't connected. They weren't built out. And I had done a lot with AWS before, but I hadn't worked with every single product that he was using. He was like using everything they had in AWS. Um, 
told me it was all set up. When I took it over, it wasn't. Um, there was a lot more to be done. And even when we tried to do like load testing before we went live, it was just a mess. Um, Eric said that must be a high paying skill set. Yeah, the, I think the average starting salary for somebody who does Kubernetes is is about 150k per year. So it's it's definitely you know in in high in in demand and and you definitely can make a pretty penny with that. So that's the whole idea of like scaling out. Now let's talk about high availability. The idea with high availability is not to have any downtime, to have really fast response times, right? You guys, everyone on this call has gone to a website. You know, your friend is like, hey, check out my portfolio. And, and you click on the link and you get like a white page <laughs> and you're sitting there for like 30 seconds before their web page comes up and renders. That's not a fast response, right? If that was an e-commerce site, you would have bounced, right? Um, so we want to regionally distribute it so that you can, no matter where you are in the world, you can you can reach this site and have that fast response. Um, you know, of course, if you're selling just to people in the U.S., you might not care about how fast a response is in Kazakhstan or something like that. And then then you know, there's this term on edge, which is not like you know, um, how, how James is on his seat right now, you know, it's, it's literally talking about, um, uh, you know, being able to move some of the computing from, from a central server to what are called edge servers, which are widely distributed. And I'll show you a, a graphic to show that here, which, so, so here, what we have is in, in Oregon, we have what we call our origin server. And this was maybe a bad a bad call on mine to put the origin server in Oregon because it's kind of a, a tongue twister there. But this is where your 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 data and your application lives on that origin server in Oregon. And then imagine you're in Florida and you go to hit that that application. So typically your 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 phone or your your computer, your laptop, whatever your device is not gonna make a direct connection to that origin server. It's gonna make a bunch of stops in between. And usually there's one of the stops is what's called an edge server. So it's in the, the network of that same origin server. And, it's, and it says, oh, okay, you want this origin server and then it goes and gets data from there. And typically the time for you, your device to hit that edge server and get a response is about 15 milliseconds really, really, really fast, blink of an eye fast. But then for you, for that data to go from that, for the request to go from the edge server to the origin, get the data and come back to the edge server is about a half a second or 500 milliseconds, which is noticeable. That's a lag. And, and so, you know, total, you're looking at 515 milliseconds here, right? Still about half a second. And that's not ideal, right? That's a little slow for every request to take that long. So what we want to do is in an ideal world, we would want this edge server ideally to have all of the brains that the origin server did, right? If this edge server had your full application and all of your data and everything it needed, then it wouldn't need to go that long cross country round trip. It could just go boop, boop, right between the edge server and your phone. So that's what we mean by on edge, right? And if people say like, oh, we're using edge computing, they mean there's kind of two, two different, two different um, definitions for edge computing. One is that it's distributed like this where the edge servers, which there can be many all over the world can be doing some of the work. And the second, the second meaning is where it's actually done on the device. So as developers, we know like, you know, Backend developers always tell the front end developers, oh, well, we should just do that on the device, right? And then the front end developers are like, no, 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 that should be in the server, right? Everybody, you know, everybody wants to pass it to the other person. But doing it on the on the device, you know, putting some of the, the business logic there, some of the data there, it 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 saves that cross-country trip, those cross-country trips. So that's another another thing about doing that. Um, yeah, and, and James, you know, James is right. Like, if you know your, your target audience is in Florida, you're not going to choose an origin server in Oregon, right? 
and that's you know that's something when when you go to publish a lot of times you get you given choices what region you want and if you know most of your audience is east coast you're going to choose a server on the east coast for example right and and all of the systems allow you to do that so one way to to do high availability which this is kind of the way that kubernetes does things or you know that that yeah that that we do things with kubernetes is you create multiple clusters. You say, oh, I'm gonna have two East Coast servers and I'm gonna have two West Coast servers and two central servers. And I'm gonna deploy my application through Kubernetes to all of these, right? So no matter where you are, there's a server close by that has your application on it. And, and this, is, this is the Kubernetes way. And this is one way to do things, right? Another way is to do things through a content delivery uh, a content delivery network or a CDN, right? You guys maybe have heard of a CDN before. The way this works is you have one central origin server. Here I have it in Virginia, right? It doesn't really matter whether where it is, but then you have your edge servers all over. And the idea is that when you update the data that's on that, on that origin server, it's going to propagate that data out to these edge servers eventually, like over an hour, let's say. So that means if you're in Florida, maybe you're hitting that edge server in Florida and maybe you're not seeing the latest version of the website that you just pushed, but you're seeing a cached version of it, a version of it from an, you know, an hour earlier until that data propagates and then you see the new version. So you, it's a little bit slower to get, maybe to get updates out but it's super fast because you're never having to do that second jump. You've got that edge server. These are everywhere and, and you always are getting those super fast response times. So, you know, these are just two different methods, right? Again, I'm just laying out the, the fundamentals before I give you the, the secret formula here, right? Um, and those of you who know me well probably can guess the direction I'm going, but I wanna really explain why it's so good. Again, other things that matter, like being able to deploy quickly, right? And there's a lot of sites that, you know, and, and Damien is as, as like the hackathon master and, and you know, professional tinkerer. <laughs> he, he probably has a much greater list than this. I just threw a few of them up there that are really common. Like Angel and I were talking about Netlify um, before, you know, before uh, some of you guys joined the call. There's also like Damien taught me about now.sh, which is really cool. There's Heroku, Surge, which I think Damien also taught me about, TinyHost. People are using GitHub hosting, and these are awesome for toy projects. Um, but again, they're not necessarily, you know, these are ones where you're going to send to your friend and they might be waiting, you know, 10, 20, 30 seconds before your site comes up. These aren't going to be the fastest, most, most robust, most scalable. And, you know, but they're great temporary solutions. <laughs> but one of my favorite uh, toy apps, like fart app, James says, the one of my favorite uh, Russian proverbs is nothing is more permanent than a temporary solution. Right? You know, you, you and and I know, I know Dennis loves this one as well. Uh, you know, we've all had this experience, especially those of us, you know, that have been around for a little while, you build something, you're like, oh, you know, I'm just gonna build it like this for now and I'll come back and fix it. And then six years later, you're looking at that code. Why did I do this, right? Um, yeah, so Liza, Liza, I actually found out recently, I've heard this, I've known this proverb for a long time. Found out recently, it's a famous Russian proverb. So obviously, you know, if you really want to deploy like a pro, you want to use maybe a more enterprise level option like AWS, Google Cloud, or Azure. So I want to spend a minute talking about each of those. So AWS, which stands for Amazon Web Services, they own a, 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 a lot, the lion's share of the market. It's actually, you know, some of you might be surprised that it's only 33% now because it used to be much more, but Azure and Google Cloud are both growing really, really fast, much faster than Amazon is. Um, and there's a lot of reasons for that. But they're still, Amazon is still bigger than the next four, you know, than, than numbers two, three, four, and five, right? They're still bigger than the next four. 
um, which are Azure, Google Cloud, Rackspace, and I don't know who the fifth is. Um, Amazon is, you know, is, is known for being, you know, for, for being the first to have to offer these cloud services. Um, and it's also the most widely used. Um, it is not the best. You know, MySpace was the first really big social network. How many of us still use MySpace? Um, Amazon AWS's most recent major outage was Wednesday, as in a week ago. Um, that was quite disruptive, especially, you know, leading into Black Friday and things like that. Um, so the next largest one is, is Azure, which I know Damien is a huge fan of. And I think that James is too, if I'm not mistaken. Their pricing is very similar to AWS. If you compare similar setups, um, your, your pricing is like within a dollar. They're, they track really well. They keep up now AW, you know, they keep up really well with AWS's prices, but you know, their offerings are a little more current than AWS. Um, and they, you know, they work really well with, with developers. Microsoft's been becoming a very developer friendly company in the last few years. Um, so they're growing two to three times faster than AWS's. So they're hot on, on the tail of Amazon here. And then the third is Google Cloud or GCP, Google Cloud Platform or GCP. And when you compare their pricing, similar structure and everything to Amazon or Azure, they come in about 20% less expensive. So Google is actually not making their, their bread and butter through, um, you know, through, uh, through this. They're, they're making their, their money through ad sales and other things. Um, whereas Amazon, believe it or not, they're making their money through AWS. Um, it is Google Cloud's infrastructure is about 10 times more robust than Amazon. And they're, when you compare services one-to-one, -one, they're about, the, depending on the service, it will range between four and 20 X faster. And I, you know, encourage you guys to, to test this and to look this up, but consistently, um, consistently test four to 20 times faster than AWS. And they offer more modern tools than AWS. So I'm a huge fan of Google Cloud, as, as many of you already know. Um, but again, you know, these one thing these three have in common, you know, Google Cloud, Amazon, you know, AWS, and Azure, is they're complicated. They're yeah, Eric says they're more secure as well. Eric, you're by default, yes. You can set up really secure systems in in AWS. Um, but by default, um, Google comes out of the box more with, with higher levels of security. Um, but all of these, to deploy a really robust architecture, it requires a lot of training, it requires a lot of time, and it requires a lot of maintenance, right? So, so what do you do? Um, all right, so, so now <laughs> then, then you know, a couple of other considerations, easy rollout, easy rollbacks, you know, keeping your secrets secure and, and your network secure, which Eric mentioned, you know, uh, uh, Google's really good at this. I believe from what I've heard, Azure is also a little bit more solid on the security than AWS right out of the box. Um, so I want to tell you, I want to take a, a moment here before I get to the get to the punchline here and tell you guys another quick story. So I alluded to this idea of over engineering, right? Um, when, when we were about to launch this new version of, of um, yeah, Angel says Azure security is better than AWS. When we were right, we were right about to launch a brand new version. This was in 2018, I think, of, of my photos, uh, custom e-commerce platform. We built them a whole new custom e-commerce platform in React, this great node, node backend. Um, um, and, and it, you know, really, really robust, um, super robust architecture and everything. 
And, and I told you that the infrastructure, this guy told me it was ready and it really wasn't. We ended up, I worked with these engineers at AWS and they, they got it to work. We got it to work. I, I fixed some things, you know, put the Lego pieces together and glue and tape and we got it to work and we got through, um, you know, a, a holiday season, barely. Um, it was a mess, but we made it through on AWS infrastructure. And then we brought in one of the most talented, um, intelligent, and and gifted backend DevOps developers. He, he this guy does not even know how to build a website, but he knows how to deploy one. That's what he does. And he came in and he engineered us a Netflix level architecture system. We, between him and myself and our CTO, we decided to move over to Google Cloud. It was something that I had recommended right away. And this DevOps person agreed wholeheartedly. Our CTO looked into it, took our recommendation and said, go for it. Um, so we moved everything over to Google Cloud. We created this incredible infrastructure where we had clusters like the map I showed you with the plus, you know, six, nine clusters all over the country, actually um, deployed using Kubernetes with Docker images, pods, everything. Incredible, incredible infrastructure. Um, and, you know, secrets managed, SSL certificates managed, everything. The problem is it's so architect, so heavily engineered using all these different pieces that, you know, what happens when this one piece of software updates and then suddenly it doesn't work with everything else. And then you got to call this guy back in to fix all the broken architecture because all of a sudden the site is down. And we went, we spent, I think over $30,000 building out this architecture and it took many, many, many months. And it worked, it was fast. It was way better than what we had on AWS. Um, really impressive architecture. And um, you know, we ended up having to spend several thousand dollars a month maintaining it because we needed somebody on the DevOps side to, to just to maintain the architecture. But it was great. We could, as the developers, we all we had to do is push to our develop branch and it would deploy to the develop environment. If we push to the, if we push to staging, it would develop, it would deploy to our staging environment. If we pushed a master, it deployed to production. It was brilliant. And we had these, this great architecture set up and it reused, it reused uh, containers. It was incredibly robust. And then I moved on and I got another job and I deployed another, a new project. And I tried out this new thing called Firebase hosting, which is also on Google Cloud. And I deployed an app there and it was so quick and easy. And I started doing some testing and it was way faster than our architecture that over here on Google. And it's, it is Google. It's just like another side of Google. And, and it was faster than this massive distributed architecture we'd built. So I did a test and I took our my photo applications, our API, our front end, our back end, everything. And I deployed it in Firebase. And I started doing load testing and speed testing using various tools to test the Firebase architecture, which cost about $18 a month to, to maintain versus the architecture on Google Cloud that we had that was costing us about $1,000 in cloud services, a couple thousand in cloud services, plus a couple thousand in DevOps. So like a $4,000 system versus like a $20 a month system. And the $20 a month Firebase system beat it in every test. Um, this system would, when you, when you pounded away on it, when you pounded away, sent hundreds of thousands of requests, you'd get about a, a 4% failure rate. So 4% of the time, you would not get a, a, the website back as, you, as requested. Um, whereas on Firebase, I was able to send it um, six times as many requests per second and get a 0% fail rate and get six times faster returns consistently. 
over this massively arc like incredibly genius architected system. So this to me was like the best of both worlds. You've got that ease of like Netlify and Heroku with a, yeah, Eric, Firebase Solutions Architect, 100%, man. So you get that enterprise level of being on Google Cloud and being scalable and managed with the ease of like Heroku. So it's like the best of both worlds. And, you know, a lot of people, when they, when they hear Firebase, they think of the real-time database, which is where it started. That, and, and they stop calling that Firebase. They call it their Firebase real-time database. And, and Angel, 4% is not really common, but I remember I was, this was like DDoS level attack I was doing on the system. I was hitting the system with like hundreds of thousands of requests per second. And Firebase was just like, okay. And our, you, this other architecture, what was happening is it was struggling to spin up pods fast enough to keep up with my requests. So some of them would time out, right? It couldn't handle the number of requests as fast as I was sending them. Firebase was like, sure, no problem. So a lot of people think of Firebase as this real-time database, which is this service right here, right? They've now extended out to include Firestore, which is a really robust, like it's it's basically like their answer to MongoDB. Um, they have a new machine learning system. They have cloud functions, which actually, the truth is Firebase cloud functions and GCP cloud functions are the same. It's just two different ways of getting at the same thing. They have a really simple authentication system. Their hosting is what I'm going to talk to you about right now. They've got cloud storage that's like S3, but much faster. Um, and then they have all these other things like in-app messaging and A-B testing and cloud messaging and all kinds of things that are really, really designed to basically become the back end for your application. So you don't even really need to build an API in a lot of cases. So it's called a back end as a service or BAS. So Google Cloud is not the same as Firebase, but they leverage the same hardware. There's a lot of overlap between them. They, they share a lot of the same services um, and they also, but they also offer their own solutions, which is really nice. They, and they play well together. So you can mix and match these services and still be behind like, you know, the same firewall, if you will. Um, Firebase hosting, which is the one, the one service I really want to talk about or focus on, it's very fast, it's very secure, and it allows you to host both static and dynamic content and microservices. And I'm going to show you that really quickly, but um, you know, it's again, why, why do I use, why do I use Firebase? It's super fast to deploy, it's super easy to set up. It scales in infinitely, like you're, you can scale the size of Google. Um, it's very secure. It's completely managed by Google. So you never have to hire a DevOps person, right? And, and their free tier is incredibly generous. So basically for most applications, you're gonna fall in their free tier. And then if you need to, if you extend beyond that, then you just pay for what you use on top of that, right? So it's really great as you're at, like, you don't, you know, unless you build something wrong or do some, you know, screw something up, you're not going to like suddenly get an $8 million bill. You're just like, if you break out of that free tier, you know, you might have like a $10 bill one month. And that's because everyone was using your app. It's a good thing, right? How easy is it? It's Firebase deploy. That's the command to deploy. And oh, have I mentioned that it's crazy fast? Um, so basically when you, when you deploy a static site and I'm gonna show you how to do this because Angel, to, Angel put me to bat to the, on this. So I'm gonna actually demo this. Um, it actually uses Google's CDN and it, it deploys your site onto their, onto their content delivery network. So it's crazy, highly available. It's infinitely scalable and secure and it takes one line. To deploy. Um, I'm going to show you that. And um, 
So, so Eric, Eric, let me, let me, um, you're asking, is it, is it intended to, so static content, like the front end of your website, like, like, uh, uh, your react site or your angular site or your view site, for example, would be static, right there. The, the user just needs to download that application and it's going to run on their machine. It's not running in a server. Whereas a back end like, like Laravel or Django, that's dynamic content. And for dynamic content, um, you actually, they also have a fully managed solution where you can use your favorite tools. Um, I use Express um, and, and you can also use, uh, you can use edge caching. So, you know, you have this stored in a server, you know, you have your, your, your main server somewhere that's running this, but you can cache your data like the response from any API point on edge by using one line of command. So if you're not familiar with express, right, this is a, this is a function here called get students, right? And it, it takes a request and a response. And then the, the last line here, it's saying like, send the response of students, right? Whatever that is, right? But this line before it is saying to set on the response, set the cache control to be public, have a maximum age of five minutes and a server maximum age of 10 minutes. And, and this is this one line of code here basically says, hey, somebody's probably gonna call this get student route again. Let's cache it on the edge server, right? So the first, the first time somebody calls this, it might take 500 milliseconds to get that response. But then they call it again and it takes 15 milliseconds because they're getting it from the edge now, it's cached there. So this is a really cool way and you can play around with these times and everything, but it's a really cool way to, to, to cache your, your, um, your stuff on the edge. So, so how easy is it, right? And I'm gonna show you real quick, but first, if you haven't already set up your Firebase command line, you can just like, and you know, NPM install globally Firebase tools Right, that's step one. Step two is you say Firebase login, which then will open up Chrome. You click on your, your Gmail account or whatever, and boom, now you're logged in. Google knows who you are. And then when, the, when, you, for, when you want to initialize a project as a Firebase project, just like Git init, you do Firebase init. And then it walks you through, like you choose hosting, you create a project, whatever, and, and you set it up. And you can, just like Git, you can go to GitHub and set up a project and then connect the two. You can do that with Firebase, but also right from command line, you can set up, you can create a project. So, and then you just do Firebase deploy anytime you want to deploy. So let's, let's see that real quick. So here I am on command line, right? If you guys can bear with me another minute and I'm going to do NPX um, create React app, and I'll just do Firebase demo, Firebase React demo, we'll call it. And this is gonna take a minute. So while this is going, I'll continue my, my lecture because this, you know, this is just create React app. It's installing all these dependencies. It's gonna take a minute, right? So I just wanna tell you that for dynamic content, there's a few more steps involved. Um, you you have to initialize the hosting, then you initialize functions, then you you know install and set up Express, and do all of you know build out your Express app, and then you just have to in the Firebase file that gets created, you have to tell it to point the requests to that that Express app, and then you just deploy and you're good to go. And and I gave you a link here which I'm going to show you is um, this, this is a page here, right? Oh, thank you, Damien, put it in the, in the, in the chat. This, this page right here walks you through it. Um, there is one point where it's like, um, it says somewhere in here, like make, um, make sure you've already set up, right? It says initialize hosting, right? right here, initialize hosting. That's really like step one. And it's easy to overlook that and go right to step two. 
Um, but if you watch this video, this guy walks you through it and, and like step-by-step -step builds an express app. This, this, um, these instructions here do the same. They walk you through and build an express app that, that you can deploy. So it's, it's pretty, it's pretty robust. Um, so that's that. So let's, let's jump back. Um, let's jump back to, I'll exit this and let's jump back and see if, okay, so we did, this did finish installing. So I'm going to go CD Firebase React demo. And, you know, if just for, for those of for those of you that that aren't familiar with um, with React, uh, you know, create React app. This basically builds us out just this generic React application, which is firing up right now. There we go, and we get this right. And you can see I'm on localhost, right? So now let's I'm going to Control C, and I'm going to say Firebase init. Right? I don't have to I don't have to install Firebase command line tools because they're already installed and I don't have to log in because I'm already logged in on this machine. So those first two steps, I'm going to skip skip and this will only bear with me. I know we've got two minutes left. I can do this in two minutes. Right. So I'm going to choose hosting. So I'm nice. just using arrow keys, choose hosting, hit enter. And I can choose an existing project, which will list out all my Firebase projects, and I just pick the one I want. But I'm going to say create a new project, right? Don't you wish you, you know this this easy with Git? And I just have to give it a name. So we're going to call this Firebase um, React Demo, and and then I can I can just accept. Whoa, what did this error? Ah. There's already a project with that ID. That makes sense. Um, so let's try and come up with a more um, a more unique name, right? We'll call this Firebase BC Dem demo for Boca Code. And let's see if we we got a unique name there. That's one thing: is your your project name does have to be unique. Um, this looks like we got we got past that. So now what it's doing is it's actually notice what it says. It's creating a Google Platform project. So it's creating a project in Google Cloud Platform. Then it's also provisioning everything I need in Firebase, right? And then it is now it says my Firebase project is ready, right? And it gives me the console where I can go. Here's the URL to my console for Firebase. And then it says, you know, my public folder is set up. I think with, um, with create React app, I think we use build, not public. So I'm gonna choose build, not public as my public directory. And then it asks me if I wanna set this up as a single page app. Because this is React, I'm gonna say yes, right? And, and then it says set up automatic builds and deploys. Um, so notice this, we can set up CI CD with GitHub. I'm not gonna go through that now, but you can. So all you have to do is push to GitHub and it deploys for you. I'm gonna say, I'm gonna say no for now, just for timing. And now we're set up, right? So I just had to do that one time. And now if you notice it created this Firebase RC file for me, this Firebase JSON file, and now I'm ready to deploy. Well, to go to production, we want to say yarn build, right? We want to build our React app. We don't want to deploy our development app. We want to deploy our production app, which is why I use the build folder, right? If you guys don't know, in Create React app, you can see it takes like 20 seconds to do that. In Create React app, when you build, it copies your, your public folder to a build folder, builds everything, puts it in there and it's done, right? So now I can do this Firebase deploy, and now we have to wait about six to eight seconds um, for this, you know, it took 10, it took 11 seconds to build, it took five seconds to deploy, and now you can see we've got a URL here, here's our console, here's our URL, Firebase demo, 
app. I'm going to open a new tab. I'm going to go to that URL and there it is. And you can see, you don't have to wait 30 seconds for this shit to load, right? This is highly available. This is highly scalable. We can get, we can hit this with 10, you know, a hundred thousand requests per second and it will not stutter. Right? So that is my demo for you guys. I'm going to stop sharing and I'll, I know we're just over time here, um, but I'll, I'll, I'll open it up for a couple of questions and answers if you guys, you guys have them. So Andre, was, says, how does it compare to other platforms in terms of infrastructure um, as code? Can you replicate setups? Um, yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's stupid simple because you just have all you have Andres is your Firebase JSON and Firebase RC files, and that's it. And they're already created for you. But when you do more advanced things, you could go in and, and edit those and then deploy from that. It's so easy. And you can actually define multiple environments. So you can like deploy to your staging, deploy to your develop, deploy to your production environment, just in those two files, your Firebase JSON and Firebase RC. Um, so it doesn't really have a solution necessarily for everything DevOps related. It's getting there, but you know, I have yet to successfully deploy like a Django app, for example, on 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 Firebase. For for Node, it's it's a breeze. It's a dream for deploying Node applications. It's like it's not like it's it's a couple of more steps than what you saw to deploy React. Um, to deploy like a full node API and, um, you know, super secure and everything. Um, but I haven't been able to, you know, Django is like infamously famous for, for being a pain to deploy. Um, that's why, you know, you can see there's sites like Python anywhere that are trying to solve that. But I have yet been able to successfully deploy a, a Django application to that. Um, but it's, it's coming, it's close. It's really close. And you guys can come off mute if you want to, if you want to, um, ask, is it, open and free uh, or... is this open and free? Like we could just use it or is it based on like, you have to make an account and it you only give you like a certain amount of slots for websites that you have to allot. How's that work? Yeah. Great question. So I kind of skipped that slide, but basically they, it is, it is free. You can use, you can deploy as many sites as you want, but they do have certain limitations. Although those limitations are like up here, you know? So unless you're like, unless you have some monster application or like you're trying to mine Bitcoin or something crazy, um, you're gonna like for most, for most applications, you're gonna be under that free tier. And, and then what will happen is they will send you they'll send you like a notification like, hey, you're exceed, you exceeded your free tier. Um, so what I do is if, I, if I'm worried about that, I just switch, you switch from the, the, the Spark plan to the Blaze plan, the Spark plan's free, the Blaze plan has, has, you know, has billing, but they, is, if you're in that free tier, you're, you're billed zero dollars, right? And then if you go over it, it's not like, like some of the systems they're like, oh, it's free for this. But if you're this size, then you have to pay for all of this. Right, so there's no minimum billing. Right, it's, so what, it's incremental. So this is free always. And if you go over it by a little bit, you're just paying for this tiny little amount here. So right. I get bills, I get bills from them. Like, cause I have some huge apps that I'm running. Like I run Boca code off of this. And, you know, we, we do a lot, you know, we've got a lot of traffic and, and I, you know, with all of my sites that I run, everything that I'm running, I've got hundreds of projects for clients and everything. I get billed like $14 a month on a bad month. Amazing. Busy month, you know, right, right, right. And this would be really good for people who um, are deploying websites to show to potential employers, right? Cause it would be snap. It would be snappy it would all just load and it just looks really nice and clean right 100 percent, angel you know it's you know a lot of people say to me like oh well i don't need all that infrastructure i'm just it's just my portfolio or something like that 
right? But don't you want your portfolio <laughs> to like come up instantly and people, oh, wow, wait, that yeah. whole that loaded right there, you know? That's yeah, because the, when it comes in in pieces, it's not a reflection on you. It's just what you're running it on. But, you know, maybe to like a hiring manager or a recruiter or something doesn't know that about that as much. They're like, oh, no, it's coming in in pieces. It's coming in, in chunks. I don't know. Right. Yeah, definitely. Exactly. So, I mean, I'm a, you know, you guys know, like, uh, those of you who know me well know, like, when I find something that I love, I, I, I advocate for it like crazy. Um, you know, even my friends, you know, like I'll, I'll sing Damien's praises till I'm, I'm blue in the face because he's amazing. Um, you do kind. This, is, this is one of those where like, I just, I can't say enough positive about it, but it really like, it, it lets you, it lets you act as though you're like that 250K a year, like DevOps master with like one line, Firebase deploy, you know? And, you know, Andres is, you know, and Eric, you guys are asking about like some of the, you know, like doing like Laravel and things like that. Um, it's, it's, <laughs> I don't get a cut, unfortunately, Dennis, wouldn't that be nice? I should, right? Yeah, actually, a, I'm a, cut, a cut of zero dollars, right? <laughs> I'm working, I'm actually working <laughs> with Google so that I can give my students free credits for, for Google Cloud. Um, I'm trying to work on that, but. And the more yeah. negative credits he gets, the more, the more he has to pay. It's a, yeah, like the so, opposite of a cut. Yeah. yeah, exactly. So Eric, the, the, um, you know, you're asking like Firebase, they're trying to build out all these services. So you don't really need like that Laravel or Django backend, right? They're, they're, they're trying to create this backend as a service, especially for mobile apps, right? If you, you know, like with a web application, a lot of times you have that, like there's the front end back end. Right, but if you're a mobile developer, you're not usually a backend developer. So it's nice to have a system where you're like, oh, I could just hit the database directly, right? I don't have to go through an API to hit the database. So they've actually built their real-time, their two databases, Firestore and Firebase, which for most things, Firestore is the better way to go, um, where you can you can hit Firestore directly and like the 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 secrets, the, 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 the code that you need to hit that database is actually like publicly, like it's, it's okay that if it's, if it's seen publicly, like the way they have the security set up, it's, it's incredible. So like you can, if you accidentally like deploy it to GitHub and you're like, oh crap, there was my Firebase setup. It has all my configuration. It's okay because you like if you set up your your security right, which is how it's set up by default. Like it, it only works from the app to that, you know, and and only gives you certain permissions. And um, you know, it's it's just it's it's incredibly robust. Um, but you know, yeah, you can. There are ways you can you can actually deploy like uh, um, there's supposedly a way to deploy Laravel and Django. Um, I haven't, I've, I haven't tried Laravel re on Firebase hosting yet, um, but I have tried Django and it was, it was definitely, um, it was, it was definitely tricky. So for that, for that, they have something called App Engine, Google, Google Cloud App Engine. So that was what I did originally for, for, um, that's actually how my photo is set up right now. I didn't know that you can actually deploy the API dynamically. So I used App Engine, which also scales, scales um, automatically for you. It's fully managed. So their main two, their main two like server-based solutions are called App Engine and Cloud and Compute Engine. This is Google Cloud now, not Firebase. Compute Engine, you basically say, okay, I want this server this size, this flavor, you set it up, you could like go in and, you know, set it up just like any other, any other server that you'd provision. Whereas App Engine, they kind of automate that for you and it's all Google managed. And you basically, it's kind of like fire, like it, it has like most of the ease of Firebase with most, of, you know, with, with, with more power and, you know, with most of the scalability and everything. So, um, Oh. Tom, I, I was really blown away with, uh, with the presentation. I have a customer that uh, I am an, AW, uh, an Azure guy. I have a customer that has decided uh, um, 
is is that Azure is is not the way to go. That's the old way. Uh, so you know, a customer is always right, especially when they're wrong. Um, so I'm going to go 100%. And they they said, you know, show me AWS or, or Fire uh, or Google. And so I'm definitely going to go with Firebase uh, because you know you've, you've shown the speed and uh, the price and and uh, and I think in another presentation I, I I know that you did I think you even said said it was easy for me to sort of um, you know start it up on my credit card no problem or like you said most of the time it will be free and then all of a sudden hand it over to somebody else um, have yeah. you seen that that's so yeah yeah so two two things two points actually. Um, one is that one is that um, when you do when you deploy a static site like we just did, you don't have to set up billing. Okay. But when you deploy a, stat, a dynamic site, you actually do have to upgrade to the paid plan and mm -hmm. set up billing. I don't right. know why they have that, but but it is a restriction that they they don't let you start with the free plan for a dynamic site, even though you know, you have to really hammer it to, to get, you know, to, to get build a penny. Um, but you but, did say that, that, you know, if it's says, you know, for example, I'm developing, I will not be hit by that part. I don't have any problems with it. Right. You know, it's, uh, they're, they're going to. So, so what you can, what you can do is let's say like, let's say Damien, like um, I built out a site and then I wanted to hand it over to you. Yeah. So I can add you as an owner. I can you can add people as owners, which Perfect. a lot of a lot of these other clouds like cloud systems, they'll allow you to be like an editor but not an owner, right? Right. And so I can add you as an owner and then I can I can disable my billing. I have to actually like drop it down to the free for a minute and then you go in and you set up your billing. So I mean it's like it's it's a little clunky in that regard that I have to like downgrade it for a second sure. and then you upgrade it. But that's a way to just hand off the billing from one person to another. Um, yeah, that's perfect. You've, you've I, sold me on that. Yeah, that's, that's perfect. really difficult in a lot of other systems. In, in a couple of different projects that I have, uh, that's what it will, you know, that is what we do as developers. And you know, you, you know this, you've been in this business before. So that's a big, that's a big deal. Um, big. So I appreciate that it's easy uh, with that. Yeah. Yeah, so that sounds good. You've you've answered every single question I had for for that. Uh, like I said, I was going to lean towards Google anyways, um, just because AWS is uh, like it was chatted on the Slack channel that you mentioned a little bit earlier. Uh, you know, it, it, the the comment was uh, AWS seems to go and say, well, whatever IBM would do, however uh, ugly IBM would make it, make sure it's five times uglier. So yeah, yeah, compete. I think yeah, yeah. Somebody said that wasn't my comment. It was like I forget. I think it was Rick's. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but but but, uh, Eric, but Eric, that's I, I love your comment there in in chat. It's like I've had that too, where people are like, "Oh, Firebase," like they a lot of people I think look at Firebase like it's like it is one of those toy systems, and and I can tell you like from doing extensive testing and research, it is far from it, and it will I could I will happily put a Firebase deployment up against up against any AWS, Azure, even Google, you know, straight Google Cloud, um, anytime, anytime. The only thing that will ever come close to it is if you actually deploy a static site to Google Cloud storage. You know how like in Amazon, in AWS, you can like put your site in an S3 bucket you can do the same in Google Cloud with their with Google Cloud Storage, um, and and I would imagine that that might be similar speed um, because it's the same you know it's the same architecture it's the same infrastructure, but I've tested S3 buckets versus Google Cloud um, Storage right and Google Cloud their names are so much more generic like S3 and Glacier and Ice and all this stuff versus like Google Cloud Storage, freaking simple. Um, I've done like direct tests, and it, it's just so much faster. They they just use their their pipelines are so much wider. They're like ten times wider. So even if you have the same number of servers, you're just like there's so many more lanes in the Google Highway than in anyone else's highway. You just can't you can't compete. So and it you know it doesn't go down. It does you know Google Cloud their services have gone down before. I think um, twice that I know of in the last, or three times I think in the last eight years, 
Whereas like AWS, I could tell you three times in the last two years they've gone down. And I think it's been more than that, but I don't use them as much, so I don't pay much attention anymore. But yeah, Damien, I think I think definitely steer them towards towards the you know the Google and or Firebase side. I, I will. I already created it. as you were talking, and I just created that project on on Firebase, uh, and I'm going to go with the code with the Blaze pay as you go plan. Like you said, it should cover everything. You know, if, if it goes into couple Super of generous. bucks i don't yeah, have a problem with super that. generous yeah. free free level so but you're right and in, oh. in they they are very kind and they show you you know where what what plan you're in and they give you all the details as what you can do and what you can can't do on it yeah. um with that so that's that's fantastic that's the other thing like i i don't know as much with azure but i know with aws and with google cloud the pricing is is not always straightforward Yes. And, and Firebase, that's another thing that they've done is they've just, they're like, we're going to make our pricing easy and more straightforward. So. Absolutely. That's fantastic. So um, Lane had asked if the better performance of, of GCP is them expecting future growth. Um, I, you know, I think that they're, I, I don't think so. I don't, I don't know, Leonid. I think it's just, um, I talked to somebody from, from Google Cloud, a local expert, and he was, he just, they, Google has just always built massive redundancy wherever they build, right? And, you know, it's, it's also like, you know, when you travel, like if you go up north, um, you notice like the highways, you know, they always build the highways with two lanes. And, you know, so then they're always under construction because they're like, oh, we've always got to add, now we got to add another lane as, you know, more people. And, you know, and then you, you move to, you go to like a newer area, like, I mean, yeah, sure, in South Florida, we're growing a lot faster, but, you know, they, they didn't build the, lane, you know, the highways with two lanes. They built them, you know, with on-ramps and off-ramps and multiple lanes and things, you know, and still they get, they get congested, but Google, they just lay down like the widest pipe they can and they just figure, you know, the, the, the more lanes, the better, right? I think it's just a philosophy. So, all right, well, with that, I'm gonna, I'm gonna end it, um, but I thank you guys so much and I appreciate all the great questions and you guys joining me. And if you, as always, if you have any questions, you know, hit me up, Todd at bocacode.com. But unlike today, it won't be free. I got, I got some free great advice from an architect. So, you know, I thank you for that. <laughs> see you guys later. Cheers, guys. Thanks for the great presentation. Good to see you guys.